Section 38, Chapter 10 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book 1, Chapter 10. Chapter the Tenth. Of the People, Whether Aliens, Denizens, or Natives. Having, in the eight preceding chapters, treated of persons as they stand in the public relations of magistrates, I now proceed to consider such persons as fall under the denomination of the people. And herein all the inferior and subordinate magistrates, treated of in the last chapter, are included. The first and most obvious division of the people is into aliens and natural-born subjects. Natural-born subjects are such as are born within the dominions of the crown of England, that is, within the legions, as it is generally called, the allegiance of the king, and aliens, such as are born out of it. Allegiance is the tie, or ligament, which binds the subject to the king, in return for that protection which the king affords the subject. The thing itself, or a substantial part of it, is founded in reason and the nature of government. The name and the form are derived to us from our Gothic ancestors. Under the feudal system, every owner of lands held them in subjection to some superior or lord, from whom, or whose ancestors, the tenant or vassal had received them. And there was a mutual trust or confidence subsisting between the lord and vassal, that the lord should protect the vassal in the enjoyment of the territory he had granted him, and, on the other hand, that the vassal should be faithful to the lord and defend him against all his enemies. This obligation on the part of the vassal was called his fidelitas, or fealty, and an oath of fealty was required, by the feudal law, to be taken by all tenants to their landlord, which is couched in almost the same terms as our ancient oath of allegiance, except that in the usual oath of fealty there was frequently a saving or exception of the faith due to a superior lord by name, under whom the landlord himself was perhaps only a tenant or vassal. But when the acknowledgment was made to the absolute superior himself, who was vassal to no man, it was no longer called the oath of fealty, but the oath of allegiance and therein the tenant swore to bear faith to his sovereign lord, in opposition to all men, without any saving or exception. Contra omnis hominis fidelitatum fecit. Land held by this exalted species of fealty was called feudum ligium, a liege fee, the vassals hominis legi, or liegemen, and the sovereign their dominus legius, or liege lord. And when the sovereign princes did homage to each other, for lands held under their respective sovereignties, a distinction was always made between simple homage, which was only an acknowledgment of tenure, and liege homage, which included the fealty before mentioned, and the services consequent upon it. Thus, when Edward the Third in 1329, did homage to Philip the Sixth of France, for his ducal dominions on that continent, it was warmly disputed of what species the homage was to be, whether liege or simple homage. With us in England, it becoming a settled principle of tenure, that all lands in the kingdom are holden of the king as their sovereign and lord paramount, no oath but that a fealty could ever be taken to inferior lords, and the oath of allegiance was necessarily confined to the person of the king alone. By an easy analogy the term of allegiance was soon brought to signify all other engagements, which are due from subjects to their prince, as well as those duties which were simply and merely territorial. And the oath of allegiance, as administered for upwards of six hundred years, contained a promise to be true and faithful to the king and his heirs, and truth and faith to bear of life and limb and tearing honour, and not to know or hear of any ill or damage intended him, without defending him therefrom. Upon which Matthew Hale makes this remark, that it was short and plain, not entangled with long or intricate clauses or declarations, and yet as comprehensive of the whole duty from the subject to his sovereign. But at the Revolution, the terms of this oath being thought perhaps to favour too much the notion of non-resistance, the present form was introduced by the Convention Parliament, which is more general and indeterminate than the former, the subject only promising that he will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the King, without mentioning his heirs, or specifying in the least wherein that allegiance consists. The oath of supremacy is principally calculated as a renunciation of the Pope's pretended authority, and the oath of abjuration, introduced in the reign of King William, very amply supplies the loose and general texture of the oath of allegiance. It recognizes the right of His Majesty, derived under the Act of Settlement, engaging to support him the utmost of the juror's power, promising to disclose all traitorous conspiracies against him, 
and expressly renouncing any claim of the pretender, in as clear and explicit terms as the English language can furnish. This oath must be taken by all persons in any office, trust, or employment, and may be tendered by two justices of the peace to any person whom they shall suspect of disaffection. But the oath of allegiance may be tendered to all persons above the age of twelve years, whether natives, denizens, or aliens, either in the court lead of the manor, or in the sheriff's torn, which is the court lead of the county. But besides these express engagements, the law also holds that there is an implied, original, and virtual allegiance, owing from every subject to his sovereign, incidentally to any express promise, and although the subject never swore any faith or allegiance in any form. For as the king, by the very descent of the crown, is fully invested with all the rights and bound to all the duties of sovereignty, before his coronation, so the subject is bound to his prince by an intrinsic allegiance, before the superinduction of those outward bounds of oath, homage, and fealty, which were only instituted to remind the subject of this his previous duty, and for the better securing its performance. The formal profession, therefore, or oath of subjection, is nothing more than a declaration in words of what was before implied in law, which occasions Sir Edward Coke very justly to observe, that all subjects are equally bounden to their allegiance, as if they had taken the oath, because it is written by the finger of the law in their hearts, and the taking of the corporal oath is but an outward declaration of the same. The sanction of an oath, it is true, in case of violation of duty, makes the guilt still more accumulated, by superadding perjury to treason, but it does not increase the civil obligations to loyalty, it only strengthens the social tie, by uniting it with that of religion. Allegiance, both express and implied, is, however, distinguished by the law into two sorts or species, the one natural, the other local, the former being also perpetual, the latter temporary. Natural allegiance is such as is due from all men born within the king's dominions immediately upon their birth. For immediately upon their birth they are under the king's protection, at a time, too, when during their infancy they are incapable of protecting themselves. Natural allegiance is therefore a debt of gratitude, which cannot be forfeited, cancelled, or altered, by any change of time, place, or circumstance, nor by anything but the united concurrence of the legislature. An Englishman who removes to France, or to China, owes the same allegiance to the King of England there as at home, and twenty years hence as well as now. For it is a principle of universal law that the natural-born subject of one prince cannot, by any act of his own, no, not by swearing allegiance to another, put off or discharge his natural allegiance to the former. For this natural allegiance was intrinsic and primitive, and antecedent to the other, and cannot be divested without the concurrent act of that prince to whom it was first due. Indeed, the natural-born subject of one prince, to whom he owes allegiance, may be entangled by subjecting himself absolutely to another. But it is his own act that brings him into these straits and difficulties, of owing service to two masters, and it is unreasonable that, by such voluntary act of his own, he should be able, at pleasure, to unloose those bands, by which he is connected to his natural prince." Local allegiance is such as is due from an alien or stranger-born, for so long time as he continues within the king's dominion and protection, and it ceases the instant such stranger transfers himself from this kingdom to another. Natural allegiance is therefore perpetual, and local temporary only, and for this reason, evidently founded upon the nature of government, that allegiance is a debt due from the subject, upon an implied contract with the prince, that so long as the one affords protection, so long the other will demean himself faithfully. As, therefore, the prince is always under a constant tie to protect his natural-born subjects, at all times and in all countries, for this region their allegiance due to him is equally universal and permanent. But on the other hand, as the prince affords his protection to an alien, only during his residence in this realm, the allegiance of an alien is confined, in point of time, to the duration of such his residence, and in point of locality to the dominions of the British Empire. From which consideration Sir Matthew Hale deduces his consequence, that, though there be a usurper of the crown, yet it is treason for any subject, while the usurper is in full possession of the sovereignty, to practice anything against his crown and dignity. Wherefore, although the true prince regain the sovereignty, yet such attempts against the usurper, unless in defence or aid of the rightful king, have been afterwards punished with death, 
because of the breach of that temporary allegiance, which was due to him as king de facto. And upon this footing, after Edward the Fourth recovered the crown, which had been long detained from his house by the line of Lancaster, treasons committed against Henry the Sixth were capitally punished, though Henry had been declared an usurper by Parliament. This oath of allegiance, or rather the allegiance itself, is held to be applicable not only to the political capacity of the king, or regal office, but to his natural person, and blood-royal, and for the misapplication of their allegiance, viz., to the regal capacity or crown, exclusive of the person of the king, were the Spencers banished in the reign of Edward the Second. And from hence arose that principle of personal attachment, and affectionate loyalty, which induced our forefathers, and if occasion required, would doubtless induce their sons, to hazard all that was dear to them, life, fortune, and family, in defence and support of their liege lord and sovereign. This allegiance, then, both express and implied, is the duty of all the king's subjects, under the distinctions here laid down, of local and temporary, or universal and perpetual. Their rights are also distinguishable by the same criterions of time and locality, natural-born subjects having a great variety of rights, which they acquire by being born within the king's legions, and can never forfeit at any distance of place or time, but only by their own misbehaviour, the explanation of which rights is the principal subject of the first two books of these commentaries. The same is also in some degree the case of aliens, though their rights are much more circumscribed, being acquired only by residence here, and lost whenever they remove. I shall, however, here endeavour to chalk out some of the principal lines, whereby they are distinguished from natives, descending to farther particulars when they come in course. An alien born may purchase lands or other estates, but not for his own use, for the king is thereupon entitled to them. If an alien could acquire a permanent property in lands, he must owe an allegiance, either permanent with that property, to the king of England, which would probably be inconsistent with that which he owes to his natural liege lord besides that thereby the nation might in time be subject to foreign influence, and feel many other inconveniences. Wherefore by the civil law such contracts were also made void, but the prince had no such advantage of a sheet thereby as with us in England. Among other reasons, which might be given for our constitution, it seems to be intended by way of punishment for the alien's presumption, in attempting to acquire any landed property, for the vendor is not affected by it, he having resigned his right, and received an equivalent in exchange. Yet an alien may acquire a property in goods, money, and other personal estate, or may hire a house for his habitation, for personal estate is of transitory and movable nature, and besides, this indulgence to strangers is necessary for the advancement of trade. Aliens also may trade as freely as other people, only they are subject to certain higher duties at the custom-house, and there are also some obsolete statutes of Henry the Eighth prohibiting alien artificers to work for themselves in this kingdom. But it is generally held that they were virtually repealed by statute 5 Elizabeth C. 7. Also an alien may bring action concerning personal property, and may make a will, and dispose of his personal estate, not as it is in France, where the king at the death of an alien is entitled to all he is worth, by the droit d'Abin, or jus albinatus, unless he has a peculiar exemption. When I mention these rights of an alien, I must be understood of alien friends only, or such whose countries are in peace with ours, for alien enemies have no rights, no privileges, unless by the king's own special favour, during time of war. When I say that an alien is one who is born out of the king's dominions or allegiance, this also must be understood with some restrictions. The common law indeed stood absolutely so, with only a very few exceptions, so that a particular act of Parliament became necessary after the Restoration, for the naturalization of the children of His Majesty's English subjects, born in foreign countries during the late Troubles. And this maxim of the law proceeded upon a general principle, that every man owes natural allegiance where he is born, and cannot owe two such allegiances, or serve two masters at once. Yet the children of the king's ambassadors born abroad were always held to be natural subjects, for as the father, though in a foreign country, owes not even a local allegiance to the prince to whom he is sent, so, with regard to the son also, he was held, by a kind of post liminium, to be born under the king of England's allegiance, represented by his father, the ambassador. 
To encourage also foreign commerce, it was enacted, by Statute 25th Edward III, Statute 2, that all children born abroad, provided both their parents were, at the time of the birth, in allegiance to the king, and the mother had passed the seas by her husband's consent, might inherit as if born in England, and accordingly it hath been so adjudged in behalf of merchants. But by several more modern statutes these restrictions are still farther taken off, so that all children, born out of the king's legions, whose fathers were natural-born subjects, are now natural-born subjects themselves, to all intents and purposes, without any exception, unless their said fathers were attainted, or banished beyond sea, for high treason, or were then in the service of a prince, at enmity with Great Britain. The children of aliens, born here in England, are generally speaking natural-born subjects, and entitled to all the privileges of such, in which the constitution of France differs from ours, for there, by their jus albinatus, if a child be born of foreign parents, it is an alien. A denizen is an alien born, but who has obtained ex donation regis letters patent to make him an English subject, a high and incommutable branch of the royal prerogative. A denizen is in a kind of middle state between an alien and natural-born subjects, and partakes of both of them. He may take lands by purchase or devise, which an alien may not, but cannot take by inheritance, for his parent, through whom he must claim, being an alien, had no inheritable blood, and therefore could convey none to the son. And, upon a like defect of hereditary blood, the issue of a denizen, born before denization, cannot inherit to him, but his issue born after may. A denizen is not excused from paying the alien's duty, and some other mercantile burdens. And no denizen can be of the Privy Council, or either House of Parliament, or have any office of trust, civil or military, or be capable of any grant from the Crown. Naturalization cannot be performed but by an act of Parliament, for by this an alien is put in exactly the same state as if he had been born in the King's legions, except only that he is incapable, as well as a denizen, of being a member of the Privy Council, or Parliament, etc. No bill for naturalization can be received in either House of Parliament without such disabling clause in it. Neither can any person be naturalized or restored in blood, unless he hath received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper within one month before bringing in of the bill, and unless he also takes the oaths of allegiance and supremacy in the presence of the Parliament. These are the principal distinctions between aliens, denizens, and natives, distinctions which endeavours have been frequently used since the commencement of this century to lay almost totally aside, by one general naturalization act for all foreign Protestants an attempt which was once carried into execution by the statute 7 and c5, but this, after three years' experience of it, was repealed by the statute 10 and c5, except one clause, which was just now mentioned, for naturalizing the children of English parents born abroad. However, every foreign seaman who in time of war serves two years on board an English ship is ipso facto naturalized, and all foreign Protestants, and Jews, upon their residing seven years in any of the American colonies, without being absent above two months at a time, are upon taking oaths naturalized to all intents and purposes, as if they had been born in this kingdom, and therefore are admissible to all such privileges, and no other, as Protestants or Jews born in this kingdom are entitled to. What those privileges are, was the subject of very high debates about the time of the famous Jew Bill, which enabled all Jews to prefer bills of naturalization in Parliament, without receiving the sacrament, as ordered by Statute 7th James I. It is not my intention to revive this controversy again, for the Act lived only a few months, and was then repealed. Therefore, peace be now to its minds. End of section 38